You're watching Chewing the Cud with Mike Banging Moo and Dominic Berry. And I said, I want to paint your face like the Mona Lisa. And then he's like, well, it's more like a Jason Pollock. And, well, hello. This week, we welcome our guest host, poet and avid gamer, Dominic Berry. Hi, Dom. Hello. Lovely to be here. Great to have you. So how are you finding the set? It's not too much. It's very everything. It is beautiful. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love everything about it. Every detail. I wouldn't change a centimetre. I would, but mainly with <laughs> petrol and fire. <laughs> um, but what have you got for us in the showbiz this week? Um, there is a story about pregnancy in the world of graphic novels. Ooh. Well, on the screen now you can see all the ways of getting hold of us. It's at the Could TV on social media where you can follow us, the Could.tv for our website, and on YouTube or podcast services. Look for Chewing the Could and hit subscribe. And as the name of people who have reached out and touched our souls go along the bottom of the screen, we go to Mike and the Buzz. <laughs> How do you feel about sweets? I love sweets. Favourite sweet in the world? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All of them. It's like trying all to choose them. which baby to slap. Yeah, exactly. Yes. They all have their merits and gorgeousness. Yes. I'm a big fan of a sherbet fountain. OK. Just because you can. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's a story about a gentleman who describes himself as a Willy Wonka super fan. Awesome. Or a willy super fan, if you will. <laughs> if you will. Um, as he's got a gigantic collection that's worth over a quarter of a million pounds. That is some collection. That's some yeah. collection, yeah. yeah. Um, his name's Nick Franklin, he's 44, and he's believed to have the private biggest willy... Sorry, I've misread that. <laughs> he's supposed to have had... <laughs> I got sidetracked by the word willy and biggest next to each other. Um, believed to have had the biggest private willy wonka collection in the world. Um, it comes into a scrumdilumptious... £125,000. Wow, he does look happy about it as well, doesn't it he? Wouldn't. He looks well cheerful. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> he's got stuff from the 1970s version and the 19, uh, sorry, 2007 version from Johnny Depp, as well as the, the upcoming um, Timothy Shamanamaname, however you pronounce his name. Um, is, yeah, he's <laughs> been doing it for 17 years. Yeah, so I think you either have that personality or you don't, where you just have a thing you obsess over and collect everything. Like mm -hmm. you mentioned before about me being a bit of a gamer, and I don't dip in and out of games. If I get a franchise, like it's all Sonic the Hedgehog for me at the moment. It's like, right, cool. every game, all the ones that are considered terrible, mm -hmm. all the ones that are considered like middle, just all of them, all of them. And if it's like, oh, do you, do you fancy go Mario? What are you talking about? This is the collection. <laughs> this is the collection. So, so I relate to move. that. I relate to his uh, very specific, yeah, <laughs> collection. I, I, I do something very similar with X's. <laughs> and by X's, I mean one night stands. <laughs> oh, no data. Um, so, yeah, we, we all have a slight thing that we want to collect, and yeah. mine happens to be knocked on the bedpost. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he's actually got some of the, the Wonka chocolate as well that they used in the film and some of the set. And he's not eating it, which I think is a bit of a waste. That's, yeah. Um, so, other than Sonic, what else are you, you know, on? I'll answer that in a bit. On the subject of not eating the chocolate being a waste, some game collectors, mm -hmm. uh, there's big money in putting your games unopened in like clear plastic cases to put on your wall, but but you can never ever play them. And if you, if you buy such things that have been done, it's big business. Okay. They sell for loads of money. And it's like, but it is a game, you are meant to play it, so it just doesn't quite compute for me. But however anybody has their collection is absolutely fair enough, yeah. Just thinking I don't play computer games, maybe I should start doing that. Because, yeah. <laughs> the last game I played was, um, oh, Assassin's Creed. Oh, really? The original one. And by played, I got about halfway through it, I went, oh, I'll keep dying. That's the first. <laughs> um, or Lego Star Wars on the Wii. Yes. There we go. That's the it. Lego games are wonderful because you can't really die. Your little Lego man just comes back again. Yeah, it and falls to pieces. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. wonderful, yeah. But moving on from, from things that we collect, um, to, to the census -y information. So we had the census um, not that long ago. They all had to fill out and tick boxes and say, yes, I'm this person, that person. Um, well, they've, they've come out and said, well, we've worked out where the biggest centre of gays are in the UK. Manchester. You'd think, wouldn't you? I would. Uh, Brighton. Brighton and Hove, 10.7% of the population is LGBTQ+. Wow. Yeah. Um, Lambeth, 
in London, 8.3. And then Manchester, 6.7%. So we're third. We're third. Yeah. Okay. Ahead of Cardiff with 5.3%. Cardiff is fourth. Cardiff is fourth. I'm really That's the surprised shocker. at that. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lovely little graphic that says, you know, all these places. And it's, it's a, a, a lovely little graph, sort of like the darker blue, the, the more LGBTQ plus people live there. And there's a lot of dark blue on there. Excellent. Which Excellent. I thought was, was brilliant news. Not a lot where I grew up in West Wales. <laughs> so they also sort of like looked at people's gender identity as well. And 1% of people have got a recognise a different gender than the one they have registered at birth. Um, across the country, um, and it was London that had the highest percentage there as well. Okay. Which was quite interesting, yeah. And if you want to give us some of your vital statistics, and I don't <laughs> just mean nudes, I do, please feel free to share them with us at the Could TV on social media. <laughs> and that brings us quite nicely over to our story of the week. You're a wordsmith. I am a wordsmith. How do you feel about when new words enter the vocabulary? I feel good about new words. I think that's a brilliant thing. Cool. Um, how do you feel about compound words? Yeah, great. Because the American Dialect Society have named their basically their word of the year for the last year. Okay. Have a guess what that might be. Radical. Radical. <laughs> that's not a compound word. Yeah. <laughs> I not, don't know. Um, <laughs> that shows all my stereotypical <laughs> prejudices about the USA there. Mm -hmm. Right, I don't know. What is it? <laughs> um, it's actually the suffix of ussy. OK. Um, made famous from people saying things like, um, Torrin Edgerton is the white boy I'd like to destroy my ussy, which is short for boy. Something. Um, <laughs> can we say boy <laughs> on the TV? I don't know. I said it now, haven't I? Um, but there's, they've said lots of lots of words of ussy. So yeah, so people like Little Nas X, and um, there's jokes that his bussy water broke. Okay. Uh, when he delivered his his album, because he joked about being pregnant. Um, and, and lots of other people have used the word ussy at the end to describe their. Boy places. Well, if it's good enough for little Nas X, it's good enough for me. Exactly. I, you know what? We should all be using bussy more often. Can I say that? <laughs> but yeah, um, that's not quite all from the buzz this week. Because as I mentioned, you know, wordsmith. Yeah. And you like a word or two. And sometimes. Or five or 900. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes you write them down. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Would you have written them down anyway recently, maybe? Oh, yeah, I've got a new book out. You've got a new book out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, look, and we have it just here. Yes. A little pee in the corner, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. So, called Yes Life from Dominic Berry. So, yeah. Pop that down there. So, and, and if people wanted to buy this, this, this tome, where would they buy it from? I am very proud to be with an independent publisher based in Salford called Flapjack Press. So if you have a little look online for mm -hmm. Flapjack Press, that's the best way to get it. Because, nice. you know, it supports the business more than if you get it through, like... Uh, the other places. Yeah, yeah the other. Them, them. They yeah. take loads of the cash. Really? They take Amazon loads. taking lots of money. What a shocker, eh? Right? I'm surprised yeah. by that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if we go in ahead and support in a, an independent business, it's mm -hmm. good to actually support, support them at the, the source. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Great. So now you know where you can get it. It's called Yes Life. Hint. Come by it. But that's all from the buzz this week. Thank you very much, Mike. I know I'm definitely wanting some sweeties myself after all that talk of chocolate. That was very, very mouth watering. Chocolate. Pleasure as always. Um, but next we have Dominic and the showbiz. You're watching <laughs> Chewing the Cud with Dominic and Mike. Now let's get ready for the showbiz with Dominic. <laughs> Well, showbiz, we might think of what's going on in, like, the movies or pop music, but I want to go straight to the graphic novels. That's my show business area of choice. Okay. Graphic novels. What, what is a graphic novel? Because no idea. Comic book. Longer. 
Okay. <laughs> it's like we don't say toys, we say action figures. I it's say just, toys. Yeah, it's just a euphemism <laughs> to make people like me feel a bit better about right, okay. what okay. they're choosing to do with their yeah. time. I'm not going yeah. to start calling dildos action figures. <laughs> 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 okay, so hardback comic books. Hardback comic books. Joker, you aware of him? I am aware of his work. Batman's baddie, yeah. yeah. He's pregnant. Yeah. That is the news. That is the news. Okay. It is in the latest issue of Joker, the man who stopped laughing. Uh, this twist in question comes from when there's a confrontation between Joker and Zatanna. Now, the latter foils the clown prince of crime's plot to steal Gotham's water supply. Disgusted by Joker's flirtation, Zatanna casts a magic spell which winds up with Joker waking up to discover he is nine months pregnant. He vomits up a blob of sentient mud that morphs into a tiny Joker doppelganger. How yeah. cool is that? That's different, that's interesting, that's unique. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he wakes up pregnant yeah. and throws up a baby. Yeah. Now, I'm not very good with the birds and the bees when it comes to the JJs and things, but I don't think that's how pregnancy works. I think if this had been done in a Marvel comic, the uh -huh. home of Spider-Man and the Avengers, it would have been more wholesomely done. What I love <laughs> about Batman and all the DCs mm. is, 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 is a little bit ickier. I'm a fan of the <laughs> icky. Of the ick. I'm a fan of the ick, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, I always thought an ick was something... I mean, it's, it's not a pretty picture. <laughs> I'm going to put it that it's, it's not. I get now, you. Now, I mean, so but... a big controversial thing DC did not long ago was draw Batman's penis in an episode, oh, and I'm a bit disappointed. Maybe, maybe it's something to do with the age of this sentient blob that we have no penis shots of underage sentient blobs. That's probably but, a good thing. Yeah, probably, but it caused a lot of controversy I, when they had Batman's penis. I didn't there. know that we had Batman's penis. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, come on, we're in this day and age and a drawing of a cock is shocking. That, it's not that's... shocking, I'm more intrigued. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was he well home? Yes, which also was a controversy because people were like, oh, it's like too obvious. It's too, too obvious. obvious. Too draw it with like a, a quirky penis. Are you going to draw his penis? Make it look make like it a, a curly whirly. Yeah, make it a penis of note. Yeah, a pig's penis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bottle of wine you don't need, dear. Good choice this one made there. <laughs> I've opened a bottle of wine with my penis. Anyway, um, there's a story. So, yeah, so giving birth to a, a blob, throwing it up, it's a bit... Is there not someone called Two-Face? It looks like that person. Yeah, that is also a DC character. I think Joker trumps Two-Face as the best villain because... Classic storytelling tells us there always has to be a motive and a reason. And Joker throws all that out the reason. Everything out the window, sorry. Uh, everything about Joker is chaotic and mm -hmm. random and just having a laugh. <laughs> I think Joker appeals to that side of us that would love to just run wild and do whatever we wish with no consequences. I think that's why DC do that icky, weird, horrible stuff so well. There is that small part, I believe, maybe mm. I'm projecting my own desires on <laughs> others, but that big part of us that just wants to go, and just live a life of chaos. I think Joker does that for us with his baby. Okay, cool. <laughs> that's, that's good, let's all live a life of chaos. I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> so, Moving on from comic books to other things. Uh, Stranger Things. OK. Stranger Things. I haven't watched Stranger Things, but I'm a huge Kate Bush fan. OK. And Kate Bush has had a huge... Resurgence with Resurgence, the resurgence. Now, and Kate Bush, popular with us LGBTQ plus folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the actor, Noah Schnapp, has come out. Brilliant. That is really, really brilliant. So after Strange Things, Noah Schnapp came out as gay. Fans are re-watching his emotional season four performance in a new light. Uh, Schnapp has been showered with support by the LGBTQ plus community after he came out as gay. Cast members and celebrities rushed to support him after he told friends and family he is gay after being in the closet the actor also made reference to his character, Will Byers, who he confirmed was gay in July, claiming he is more similar to Will than he thought. 
That's good. I mean, it, it's, he's only very young, 18. Mm. So, you know, coming out, I'm glad that he's been able to come do it on his own terms because, of course, the um, Heartstopper ad, um, actor was forced out as bisexual, you know, hounded out on Twitter. So the fact that they've been able to come out on TikTok in their own way is brilliant. Yeah. Especially for you know, following on their own character and stuff. I mean, I mean, he's, he's not an unattractive young man. I mean, we've got a picture of him that there. That is true. I mean, yeah. it's going to get lots and lots of dirty picture messages sent in his DMs. <laughs> Um, That's the says, first place your mind goes. <laughs> the first thing I did, to be fair. <laughs> Congratulations on coming out. <laughs> Have a go. <laughs> but yeah, he's 18, it's fine. <laughs> I didn't really send him a picture of my penis. Just your bum. <laughs> Just, yes, but, yeah. <laughs> Spread. Um, but yeah, so it, I mean, the episode in which he comes out on Stranger Things is, is a good one, and, and you're not really been into Stranger Things, have you? No. No. Um, it's worth a watch. It's very yeah. 80s based. Which, yeah. Yeah, which is why Good. Kate Bush has done, done so well out of it. Mm. Um, but yeah, well done him. Right, we've got another news story here, which is about Heartstopper that you mentioned, and okay. that is that season two is on its way. Yay. We have a little while to wait before yeah. it's back on the screens, but it's been confirmed there are going to be some new additions to the cast, uh, joining the likes of Kit Connor, Joe Locke and Yasmin Finney, mm -hmm. our new characters, Belle Priestley and Ash Self. Oh, I've got, got uh, a, picture a, of the, a picture of them enjoying a milkshake or two. Yeah, a post yeah. has uh, confirmed that the blossoming romance between the schoolboys Charlie and Nick will be further developed. Uh, this has been hailed by fans as great for its positive depiction of LGBTQ plus relationships. And yeah, it's wonderful. What I would have done for something like this when I was growing up, it's yeah. really excellent representation, isn't it? It is really brilliant. Good. I mean, it's, it's so good. And the, one of the big powerful moments is going, I didn't have that when I was a kid. And season one, I cried pretty much every episode. And I'm not being like a single solitary tear. I mean, tissues, not the whole ugly crying thing mm. yeah because it is such a great message to have for kids and it takes our story full circle back mm -hmm. to us talking about graphic novels because graphic novels is not only the superheroes of marvel and dc this began as a wonderful highly acclaimed graphic novel which really? uh, yeah yeah i did not know that yeah yeah oh, i might have to sneak ahead and re read so i know what's going to come so i'm not surprised yeah. tissues to have ready although stuff. there's always that thing are they going to change it and uh, i'm i'm usually up for changes people are like oh i'm a true fan i don't like the fact the book was better because they did this but they're different me Mediums and different things work in different things. Like with my poems, I might perform something different from how it's in the book because the live performance is different from sitting quietly on your own. And the same thing applies to this. I'm always all right if they're like, oh, well, you know, we're developing this character in, in an alternate path. It's uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I quite like it when they throw change in, especially if I've read the book already, because it's like, oh, surprise, that wasn't what I was expecting, because it's different. And it gives you opportunity to go further. They did do it Queer as Folk. So the English version, three seasons sort of thing, max. And then the Americans went like five or six um, back in the noughties. Not the new version that's just come out. It's very different before I get... Meh, 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 meh. <laughs> um, and then when they did the new version, when it, they changed the location and the story and everything. And it's still, you know, it's evolved with time, which I think was brilliant. I think you need to do that more as well. I think so, yeah. 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 Cool. But then having said that, I can see why people might feel very comforted by a show or book that's really special to them. Maybe it's gotten through a difficult time. That's what we often go to showbiz and, and entertainment for. If we need a distraction, if life's a bit of a challenge and if people are really attached to something, I guess I can understand why people are like, what? That's not what I, you know. Mm -hmm. But then that all leads to the toxic Twitter trolls and all that, isn't it? Who, like, really go on the rampage if somebody dares have a character of a different gender or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's that's less good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is less good. But then, on the flip side of that, you get the people that come out in defence of those people. And, and that's, you know, I'm thinking, like, when Elliot Page came out um, as transgender and people started to troll him and mm. everybody went, no, 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 leave tr uh, Elliot Page alone. They've done. They've done some. Something really brave, and they're an actor, and they're going to get through it. So, yeah, they, you know, it, it can be have the flip side of it as well. Did you watch the Ghostbusters with women? Yes, 
I really liked it. I did too, because Chris Hemsworth is exactly what I wanted him to be. He's... Attractive and dumb. He's so silly. I was... If anybody's going to criticise the film, I would think it would be for its choice of very, very silly humour. I remember watching at the cinema, I'd kept away from social media. I usually do if I'm really looking forward to something. Mm. And so being completely unaware of the hatred that was coming from mm. so many people for just the fact it was women. My thought was, oh, I bet a lot of people don't like these jokes. I was laughing out loud in my seat in the cinema, <laughs> especially at Chris Hemsworth. It was so funny. Yeah. But I was shocked when I went on and, and uh, I saw that they, they'd been like personally attacked. Like, what a horrible time they'd, mm -hmm. they'd had. It's just, shocking. Just for having the audacity to act. Yeah. And that is all from our showbiz this week. Great. Well, thank you for that, Dominic. I'll have to get the tissues ready for Heartstopper, and that's because I'm sad. But now... Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sad, I'm not going to masturbate over that particular show. But after this commercial break, we have a change to our regularly scheduled broadcasting, as we say I love to Dominic in Spotlight. <laughs> You're watching Chewing the Cud. This week, we're going to get all up close and personal with Dominic Barry in Spotlight. So, are you enjoying yourself so far? Oh, it's great being here. Love it. Past the halfway point now, so it's all downhill. <laughs> downhill. Um, but, uh, already said it a couple of times, you're a poet. Yes. And you're fully aware of it. I am, yeah. Not even, I didn't even do the rhyme. <laughs> I didn't do the rhyme. <laughs> can tell I'm not one. Poems don't have to rhyme, though. Welcome to the modern age. Whee! What? Since when? Right, yeah. Are you, are you joking me now? Since ancient times, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, speaking of ancient okay. times, so in my book, there's a mix... <laughs> As a plug. There's, there's, a a mix, plug. <laughs> there's a mix of rhymey and non-rhymey poems, okay. and both come in, like, contemporary modern verse styles, but also I'm a really, really, really big fan of taking really old-fashioned ways of writing and talking about modern subject matter, like my views on the government. Bullet point, not keen. <laughs> Shock. <laughs> but using stuff like haiku or sonnets or sestinas or maybe less known forms like the rondo, uh, I, I love using these forms. I think that when you look at a blank bit of paper, it could be a bit like, where do I even start? Where do I begin? And if you take a really rigid structure where there has to be a rhyme here or no rhymes or this particular rhythm or this number of syllables, I, I really enjoy working in that way. And this, more than anything else I've written, I've really gone into like all kinds of styles like uh, Arabic styles and ancient French styles. And yeah, I, I've really enjoyed that challenge. And it's a linear journey, this book. Ooh. Should you read it start to finish, there's one very specific narrative that goes through. Whereas in the past, I've had books that are just poems, just like, oh, I think this about this and this about that. Whereas a re there's a real through line through this, which is why it's called Yes Life, because it's about my views on life. Ah, so it's, it's a theme. Yeah, like very the much theme. so. Yeah, I do, Good. I do. Um, and, and you've mentioned lots of different types of poetry at me. Mm -hmm. right. I have. Yeah, yeah, and I'm there going, I don't know. Um, but what's your favourite one? That changes day by day. I really like sonnets. So could you give me a, oh, an example of a sonnet? Oh, well, Shakespeare did loads. Ten syllables in each line, uh, each... Uh, like first and third line rhyme and second and fourth line rhyme, which sounds really like nerdy and technical, which is why I love it, because <laughs> I'm nerdy and I'm technical. And I think, yeah, I get engages both bits of the brain. There's our arty side of the <laughs> brain that likes to be flamboyant and do this with our hands. I like to do this with my hands, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there's like the more sciencey mathematical bits, which people don't think that is poetry, but it can be, and I really enjoy the... It's, it's a bit like doing, like, a, a puzzle, like a jigsaw or something, like, getting all the bits. It's a challenge to be like, right, well, here's this 
type of poetry, this old form, and I'm going to make my ideas fit in this structure. And if you're like me and you've written a billion, zillion, squillion poems, you're always looking for them to sound different. You don't want people mm -hmm. to be like, oh, yeah, it's that poet Dominic. Oh, this one sounds the same as all of his others. So if you go into these different styles, it's a way of sounding different to what you sounded like before. Right, and and how do you come up with those ideas? So you you know you, you said that there's a theme in this book. How do you go? That's how I'm going to do it. Well, I was dating someone, a person I'm not dating now, but ah. we've remained really good friends. That's there is good. a love poem for this guy in this book, and he really influenced that. He said, "You've always had collections that are." more fragmented, mm -hmm. and he said, what if you did it more like a novel, more like, so there is still, or, or like a musical, you know, there's the mm -hmm. individual numbers, but they all join together. So one of the great things about Lewis and I was we had really long conversations, you know, putting the world to rights, uh, you know, and he's like, you know, these would make great ideas for poems. So mm -hmm. I think whether it's in romance or friendship or family members, if you get that connection between two people where you just love chatting, not unlike this show, that's a really good springboard for poems. Because there's this stigma with poems. Oh, poems, are they difficult? Are mm -hmm. they hard to understand? And maybe with all my talk of styles, I might have made it sound very academic. But it don't have to be. It don't have to be. All it is is saying, oh, this thing we've chatted about is interesting. Mm -hmm. What do I think are the best words I can use to to be engaging with this idea. So that, that's it. It was just from conversation, just from chatting, just from chewing the cud. <laughs> that's a plug for us now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and does, you know, mentioned Lewis, does he know that this poem's about him and stuff? Oh, very, very much so. There was a point, there's 40 poems in the book, and there was a point where about... Ten of them were love poems for Lewis. And, <laughs> and then, then we split up, but we remained good friends. And I thought, oh, is it good having, like, ten love poems for your ex in a book? And I thought, you know what, I'm keeping one of them in. I'm mm -hmm. keeping one. And I thought about, well, actually, even if we hadn't split up, I want to celebrate more than just the idea of romance. Because I think especially for us queer folks, Often our friends are our chosen family. So mm -hmm. I was talking about sonnets before. I've got a sonnet for my dear friend Michelle in the book. And I wanted to celebrate that kind of love, not just like the, the sexual love, but the platonic love. Mm -hmm. Just like who 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 are your, your, your friends who become so important? They are your family. Because for me, that really is the case. So I went through loads of my friends. So all those love poems for one person, I replaced them with, here's a poem from a friend, Nick. Here's a poem from a friend, Ian. I'm really glad that happened because it is more representative, I think, of the, the queer life. Some people find monogamy or... or or, 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 you know, open relationships within marriage or all kind of things. And some people like me are single. And I thought, well, you know, there, there's quite a lot of putting romance on a pedestal. And it's, it's quite refreshing, I think, to, to really celebrate how deep and joyful friendship can be. Completely agree with you. The chosen family thing is so big within the LGBTQ plus community because there's a lot of people out there that don't have great relationships with their family. Um, yeah. I think I became so intoxicated with the romance because it was it was a good romance. It was a good. good, he, good. He's amazing, Lewis. Yeah, I, I dearly, dearly love him and love the fact that I've got this one love poem for him. But then when the kind of uh, you know, rose-tinted goggles of romance mm -hmm. sort of faded. I thought, actually, art is about making a connection. Mm -hmm. And I don't want this book to only be for people who are either in a really joyful romance or aspire to it. I want it to be about more than that. I want it to be a broader spectrum of of ideas and concepts. So, yeah, that's an aspect of it, but but mm -hmm. not all. It's a very queer book as well. I, there's there's um, at least two bottoms which I worship, uh, one of them being He-Man. Okay. And the other being, uh, going back to my, my video game love, from the... Uh, uh, martial arts game, Street Fighter 2, okay. Blanca, okay. who is the Brazilian near-naked, big, big bulky big yeah. bear character. Yes, there's a, there's a very long poem celebrating Blanca's bottom. Mm, well, we yeah. might have to hear some of those later on. <laughs> mm. um, so apart from just, you know, you don't just write poetry, you perform it as well. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so where, what kind of spaces do you perform in? Oh, anything. So, uh, theatres are lovely. Art centres can be beautiful. Festivals are muddy <laughs> <laughs> and wet, but full of a certain vibe and ideology that's really beautiful. Pubs are fantastic. I've got a really good pub gig coming up. Uh, for those of you who live in Manchester, I'm over in Gulliver's in the Northern Quarter on the, how many days in January? 31. 31, is it? <laughs> so it'll be the 31st, yeah, the Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. I'm in yeah. Huddersfield on the Monday, and Manchester. I'm in the middle of a really big tour at the moment, which is right. just fantastic, really, because we've not done so much of that, have we, with, with lockdowns no. <laughs> and all that's gone on in the last few years. So to be on the road and, like, performing in front, oh, it's, it's, it really is a dream come true. I know for some people that's their worst nightmare, public speaking, mm -hmm. getting up. I mean, getting up in in like a workplace and doing a presentation on PowerPoint is scary enough, but to talk about feelings and emotions and men's bottoms is too much for many. <laughs> so, yeah. Not for some people. Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Quite often get told to shut up about men's bottoms. <laughs> and other stuff. Um, so you, Manchester, Huddersfield, where else are you going to be? Oh, where else? Oh, I'm going all the way to West Wales, which is where I grew up. So I'm, I, you know, my mum is, is getting older these days, so she's going to be able to come and see me at a gig in, in Cardigan, in, in, nice. in you know, the, the sort of coastal part of Wales. So I'm thrilled about that. Um, right. Yeah, all over the place, all over which the place. is so good, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm usually quite good at updating my website, dominicberry.net, so I'll put all the details on there. I hope. So if anyone wants to find us on screen now at the bottom there. Right. Well, thank you very much for that, Dominic. It's great to get to know someone a little bit deeper. But stick around, because coming up after this break, we actually have some poetry from Dominic himself. <laughs> Welcome back to Chewing the Cud. Now we're going to get all cultured as we go plunging headfirst into the poetic stylings of Dominic Berry. So we've, we've picked a couple of, of well, I wouldn't say my favourite ones of yours. Hey. Okay. Um, and we'll, we've got the first one coming up now. Life's not a linear novel. No fixed middle or end. Our lives are full of choices. I have chosen to say poems I've penned, and more than once or twice I've written poems which give advice. Don't blame others for mistakes. Take responsibility. Choose positivity. You see, I believed in the power of our choices ever since I was a kid, ever since I hid my head in Choose Your Own Adventure Books. In Choose Your Own Adventure Books, you, the reader, choose what to do and the end of the story is decided by you. Act without wisdom, go to page 92, you lose. Act honourably, go to page 63, you succeed. I felt powerful devouring these stories, so Mum got them all for me. But I know I never chose to be born healthy, able-bodied, white, British male in a home full of books with a mother's love that never failed. I grew up with someone who cared, someone who was always there. When others have tried to tell me their lives are more challenged than mine, I've often interrupted to say, good choices will make it all fine. But if my life was a choose your own adventure, my first pages were written by my mother. If all our lives are choose your own adventures, there are some books with more choices inside them than others. Brilliant. I, I loved it. Thank you. Yeah. I really enjoyed watching that. Usually, like, if you're invited on a show or something, you're performing live. And mm -hmm. I think this might be your first to just sit back and watch myself. Like, what a, what a great ego moment. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's about, you know, you, you said about the, the Choose Your Own Adventure book. And I, similar age, so had those as well. And, you know, referencing other people who've got more choices than others and that sort of thing. How did you come up with that, that idea? So, I talked about my fantastic romance with Lewis, and that was a poem that existed in a different version before meeting Lewis, and it was a lot longer, and it was specifically about how I'd been employed 
to recite poems in Manchester men's prison, what was mm -hmm. strange ways. Uh -huh. And I'd not done anything like that before. I have since. But my first going in there, first impressions really matter. And I hadn't made a great first impression. I'd, I'd gone in just trying to be cheerful. And the men in the prison had been really insulted by my positivity and um, we had a lot of conversations about choices choices available so it's one of those poems where the last line came first mm -hmm. that was like the heart of it yeah. and then I thought well how can I write to get to that point but I actively talked about being in the prison and Lewis said you know this is a long poem Dominic <laughs> and he said you know what's it really about he went I feel that it's about more than your very important experiences in the prison. And actually, if you took all of that out, and I was like, oh, that's the poem half the length. He's like, yeah, that's a good thing. Don't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's not just about what you add to writing that makes it. It's often mm -hmm. about what you take. It's a bit like making a sculptor. Like You've got a, a load of clay and you're pulling bits off. And sometimes that's what a poem's like. You have your first draft where you just go, blah, get it all down. And then you snip, 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 snip. You know, when I have written really short forms of poetry, often they have been really massive at first. And people hearing the finished Poem. My, my poem about He-Man's Bottom is a good example of that because that poem's like less than a minute long, but it went from this much down to that. Well, why don't we have a listen to a poem about He-Man's Bottom then? When I was young, my mum knew I was gay from one specific thing I drew one day. I proudly showed my mum what I had done, a crayon drawing showing He-Man's Bum. <laughs> A gift for which I craved my mother's thanks, where Skeletor was giving He-Man <laughs> spanks. <laughs> See, not one single thing could make me cheerier than drawing villains whacking that posterior. My mum said, ooh. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> and I confess, her praise made me feel such a great success. And when our neighbours came, Mum did not flinch with He-Man's bare bum blue tack to our fridge. Thank you. <laughs> I love sitting here laughing yeah. at my own poems. It's great. It's great. Is that true? Oh, yeah, every word of that poem every is true. Word every word true. of that. Yeah, yeah. I did. I used to make little plasticine models mm -hmm. of He-Man's bottom. And I made one particular drawing where I draw He-Man, like, bare bottoms. I was about, like, six, seven years old. <laughs> and then I drew, like, his enemy, Skeletor, next mm -hmm. to him. But I drew Skeletor's arm on a separate bit of paper and got my mum to cut it out, and then I sellotaped the arm on so that the sellotape made, like, a hinge, so his arm <laughs> did that, so that Skeletor could smack He-Man's bare bottom. I'm so glad you said smack. I was, <laughs> I was six. I was six. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so um, smacking here, man's bare bottom. Yeah, yeah. I'm really glad. You know, I didn't know which poems of mine you were going to choose. And one reason I'm really glad you've chosen those two is if there was one thing I would love for everyone to consider with poetry, is it's OK to say... I don't like that poem, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, I don't like poetry. Because mm -hmm. people hear a poem and they go, I don't like poetry. Whereas they don't hear a song and go, I don't like music. They go, yeah. that song's rubbish. And I don't mind anyone saying that any of my poems are rubbish. So there might be some viewers who were like, oh, that Choose Your Adventure, that, that was a bit serious. And then like the He-Man one, oh, that had jokes in, I like that one. Or the other way around, like the mm He-Man -hmm. one was a bit flippant, but the first one had, and that's great, and I think that's your goal as an artist, to make a connection and to look at different ways you might achieve that. But if people felt more confident, people feel like they're going to be considered thick if mm -hmm. they're like, oh, I don't like that poem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like th there might be the implication, you know, oh, I'm not clever enough to understand it, whereas it's not that. It's just like you're allowed to say, I don't have to give a reason for not liking a song or not liking a book. It's just not to my taste. And mm -hmm. but I think people feel shy saying that with poetry. So I'm really glad you've given very different poems from me. Really pleased. Good. I I'm, I'm glad that you enjoy it because we're going for something very similar. And it's another poem about a bump.
Yeah! Guile's smile is not my style. Zangief's beef is best left sheathed. Ken's bottom might seem tighter. You're the sexiest street fighter. You're the sexiest street fighter. Pale males fail. Green's brighter. <laughs> Grab my joystick, pull it all night. Exciting, biting, lightning enticer. Nicer than a slicing from Vegas claws. Far nicer than the tiger, Sagat roars. Splatter me with flattery, no cause to pause. The sexiest street fight with your big howls and growls. Such feral calls, your special moves. Those rolling balls just can't improve. <laughs> You've got it all. Blanca, your drooling thralls. Blanca, you strike me dumb. I love to watch you scratch your bum. So let me kiss your bulging tongue. Blanca, Blanca, let me come into your arms, into your game. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> When I proclaim, I love your snarls, your teeth, your name, your orange chest hairs, raging flame. Conduct your vaults, bolt through me, Blanca, in this thunder. Be my anchor, you'll feel richer than a banker. Drop your shorts, let me spank ya! <laughs> you are the boss, your beast technique's enormous power is unique with animal skills. You can't put a price on. You're so much bigger than any bison. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of names in that one. Yeah. No idea who half of them were. That's all right. It's just about someone's bottom, really. All the names <laughs> are just other characters in Street Fighter. We were chatting about Sonic the Hedgehog before, mm -hmm. but Street Fighter is something I've also grown up with my whole life. And uh, yeah. Uh, so you don't need to know who they are. They're just all the characters in like the martial arts game. But Blanca uh, is the one who gets the poem. The big, big green guy. The big green guy. Mm. Yes. No one wanted to spank his bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I had all the thoughts about what he could be doing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, similar age. Similar age yeah. <laughs> that and anyway, I'm not going to talk about. It. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so you obviously shared your love of, of video games. Um, in that one as well. And are there any other particular characters you may have a posh on for? In that oh, one? my word, load. So <laughs> the big rival video game was Mortal Kombat. Mm -hmm. And Mortal Kombat had, like, the death moves. That's what they introduced, the fatalities. Mm -hmm. And this was before the internet, you know. So uh, rumours would circulate and there was no way to fact-check them. Not that the internet's change that <laughs> but yeah now you still can't um, fact check More. yeah the rumors were the rumors were that as well as the death moves there was the the naked moves that if like um you press certain buttons you did like a killing but if you de did other buttons then like you took all their clothes off and uh, yeah johnny cage from mortal kombat i dreamed for that to be true of that was it true no, uh, no, sad sadly times. not true. Sad times, sadly not true. But now we've got deep fakes, so who needs that? <laughs> 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 well, thank you so much for sharing your poetry. Oh, with us. thank you for sharing yeah. them. This has been so lovely. Brilliant. Well, it's almost the end of the show. Remember, you can join us on our social media at the Could TV. Our website is thecud.tv, and of course, on YouTube and podcasts. Just search for Chewing the Cud. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye-bye.